Uh, very good afternoon to all of y'all who have uh, physically presented to SLMA and joining us with online. So welcome uh, to the monthly clinical meeting. Uh, today we are collaborating with the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists uh, to conduct this uh, monthly clinical meeting. To conduct this monthly clinical meeting, uh, we have three eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Rohini Vadanambi, who is a consultant microbiologist and the president of Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, and Dr. Kushlani Jayatilika, consultant microbiologist from uh, Jadunpura General Hospital, and honorary senior lecturer at Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jadunpura, and Dr. Madhumani uh, Abhevadana, consultant clinical microbiologist from National Hospital of Kandy. So I would warmly welcome all the resource people and the audience and I would kindly invite uh, the three speakers to take the seats at the head table. The theme for today is combating antimicrobial resistance through antimicrobial stewardship. And our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Rohini Wadnambi, consultant microbiologist and president Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, who will be speaking to us on Think Twice, Seek Advice, Antibiotics Aren't Always the Answer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, SLMA, for organizing this uh, joint uh, um, uh, important um, lecture series. Um, so I would start uh, my lecture telling that think twice, seek advice. Antibacterials aren't always the answer. So. Everyone knows who this is. This is Alexander Fleming. Exactly the 97 years before, that is in September 1928, this um, most important person for us found out penicillin. So are we, how much are we paying our gratitude to this important finding? Let's see. So this is um, that time during early 90s, since uh, after this uh, penicillin discovery, everyone was uh, thanking, there were so many wars then, the people thanking this penicillin, telling that thanks to penicillin, he will come home. The people who are going to the war zone, they are expecting uh, they are returned because of the penicillin. It was true because those who were injured um, succumbed to death because of the sepsis. So penicillin was a miraculous drug then. So let's see what happened afterwards since this uh, uh, inception of uh, penicillin. It was in 1928. It is not very long we found out the resistance to penicillin in 1940. And... Uh, so thereafter, several antibiotics were discovered. You can see the, the names like tetracyclines, macrolides, and then uh, fluoroquinolones. Um, all these together and individually start resisting 1985 and then 1993. So that was up to 30 years, the record that I can show you here. Then afterwards, from that uh, 30 years onwards, I'll take you through the antibiotic development, what is happening there. So 1983, the time that all these macrolides and all these uh, cephalosporin, things like that are uh, found out, then gradually the development starts ceasing because of the development of resistance. So the resistance is so fast, but the development is so slow. slow. So 88 to 92 and then uh, 93 to 97, all these year uh, clusters, you can see how the antibiotic development pipeline is drying out. So by 2012, it was very little amount. What is happening here? Why are we doing here? What are we doing here? So it is by Alexander himself, he said, prescribing is the, or using is the reason to have resistance. 
So uh, the, the partners in antibiotic resistance is the user or the prescriber and the user together and the resistance. So these are hand in hand going together. So therefore we have to learn ourselves in all possible way, how can we mitigate this problem? Let's see some figures. So, um, all, all in all, in globally, the antimicrobial, antibiotic, or antibacterials or antimicrobials prescription should be happen through ID people. This ID number in this uh, chart shown in red. Then, uh, in global figures. Uh, lower respiratory tract infections comes under the highest number of sepsis. So, other than those two, surgery also, post-operative surgery and wound infection, surgical cases, vascular or other general or uh, orthopedic, all that surgical together account to another amount. But the, the highest amount of uh, uh, prescriptions going by um, non-specialists, and in this uh, graph, they are calling it hospitalists. So you can see um, the how irrational use is happening in this figure itself. In, in numbers wise, about uh, the CDC once did a survey and it found out that 100% um, prescriptions, 30% are invalid, in unnecessary. So, even now, if we rightly check, it's even more. Let's check some USA data. One of the most commonly used groups of drugs are antibiotics or antibacterials. In USA, 23 million kilograms used annually. That is 50% of medical reasons, but other 50% is uh, only for infections. So, half of the antibiotics are misused there with figures. Again, uh, may account for up to 50% of a hospital's drug expenditure. So it's, it is so here in Sri Lanka as well. Studies worldwide has shown a high incidence of inappropriate use. So, so many studies in favor of this is done. In Sri Lanka, we have some studies, but not covering whole country, but all in all, all, every study shows inappropriate use. So people are very, um, very happy to use antibiotic for anything and everything. They think that is the cure. I don't know the reason for that. But however, we are trying today, three of us are trying today, uh, what is um, happening with this misuse and how we can um, uh, give directives, uh, tested directives to you all to mitigate that. Uh, this person here, everyone knows, Charles Darwin, who found out the, the theory of emergence or selection, natural selection. So that is what is happening for antibiotic also. Among, the, among all these microbes, they are survivors, they are better survivors than us, so they are always, almost always trying to survive against any harsh environment, no matter what it is. So for them, uh, along with the animal health and the human health, uh, it is the antibiotic uh, a threat of living, so they learn to survive through selection. So what do we have in our as a problem. So we have difficult to treat organisms. We have so much of difficult to treat organisms such as MRSA, antibiotic resistant gram negatives, gram negative bacilli, which are like uh, right now even cholestine resistant in Sri Lanka, fair number of gram negative bacilli like Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, E. coli. You name most of these uh, gut originated gram-negative bacilli are resistant to almost all antibiotics we have. Um, and uh, being a, the high prevalence of TB, we have MDR-TB, now it is rising. Um, recently, um, I was happened to be in a midterm review of the TB um, uh, strategic plan, 
So there were lots of uh, things that we have to be sorry about. So C. diff is actually not a big issue for us, but it's globally a big issue. I mean, in, in certain things, we have some um, genetic um, kind of uh, uh, good aspects. We are not having much of C. diff in compared to the amount of misusing of antibiotic. So let's check. Is an antibiotic necessary always useful only for treatment of bacterial infections? This is, this is the fact. Not all fevers are due to infections. Not all infections are due to bacteria. There is no evidence that antibiotics will prevent secondary bacterial infection in patients with viral infection. So these are some misnomers. That is why this slide is trying to show that uh, those who are misusing antibiotic to point some reasons. So this is CDC um, checklist for antibiotic are not always the answer. So, cold and running nose is mostly virus, no need of antibiotic. Bronchitis, chest cold, in otherwise healthy children and adults, it's virus, so no need of antibiotic. Whooping cough, yes, it is antibiotic required bacterial thing. Flu, common flu, there are various kinds of flu, viral origin and sometimes allergy origin, so no need of antibiotic. Streptococcal sore throat, when it is clinically diagnosed or microbiologically diagnosed, yes. Sore throat, except streptococci, no need of antibiotic. Fluid in the middle ear, otitis media with effusion, no antibiotic. But how many of us, even specialists, prescribe um, just earache with antibiotic? Not one, not two, sometimes sometimes mostly three. Urinary tract infections, yes. So even in urinary tract infections, not do not report the uh, do not treat for the reports. You have to clinically evaluate. Each conditions you have to clinically evaluate, clinically correlate, and then choose antibiotic and use it rationally and optimize the doses. And then only we we can be happy that we are not allowing selection among bacteria. Um, there are a couple of other reasons we have to uh, check on here. A um, couple of things. Uh, it didn't move. Yes. Um, some of the common reasons of developing antibiotic resistance may be failure to complete therapy. Some will take one or two days of the initial illness and then stop it. And that is even if the antibacterials are used for a viral thing, his own body bacteria become uh, acquire resistant genes. That would happen automatically. Skip, skipping of prescribed doses is also another way of helping selection. And self-medication is another. Reu reuse of leftover antibodies. These are common things, thinking the cost-wise and thinking the easiness of wise people are doing in countries like ours where the antibiotics are easily um, easily accessible. So it, it is another problem. So to reduce antimicrobial resistance, there are many other ways other than antibiotics. Infection prevention and control, improved diagnostics and rapid diagnostic, and especially for respiratory infections and everything else, and minimize and unnecessary um, antimicrobial use, uh, targeted uh, narrow spectrum therapy and uh, continued describing uh, discovery of antimicrobials also helpful when there are resistance and when there are no more options and reduce resistant resistant reservoirs that is animal and environmental this is like one health approach and there's another very proven important aspect antimicrobial stewardship program so uh, that is one of the answers. If we do not do action today, no cure tomorrow for this resistance issue. So uh, in a nutshell, I will just um, uh, show, tell you that 
uh, antimicrobial stewardship are confirming that the patient has an indication for antimicrobial therapy and antimicrobial stewardship in a nutshell is right drug, right time, right dose, right duration, and uh, right route. So it will be elaborated by two of the speakers coming after me. And uh, so before that, I'll give you a short history, which I um, have, has happened to see a patient in this morning. Um, this is a male uh, patient, late 50s, big made with short stature, who attend to see a gem mining site about four days ago, away from his home. Had some mud sprayed on one of his legs, which he scraped using a piece of wood. And the same night, he didn't have any other symptoms anywhere in his body. He developed a fever with chills. Immediately, he went to a private practice and uh, went to the doctor and told he has fever and a little bit chilly and need to cure soon to go home next day. So it's a demanding patient. He's a demanding patient. So he was given about uh, two types of antibiotics not knowing whether infection or not, or a source of infection, if it is an infection. So without knowing any of those, um, a registered doctor who is practicing in the morning in the hospital and who had a private practice in the afternoon gave him um, one shot in terms of that uh, people are familiar with. So the night he noticed the leg pain and full-blown cellulitis and got admitted in a Colombo hospital uh, far from his home. He is uh, an at risk of diabetes after doing um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, HB1AC and uh, found out that uh, uh, now he was uh, stable with optimized antibiotics right now through a MDT. So I took this case not to discuss the management, but to show the importance of uh, asking this patient's history. And uh, the, the, he, without asking anything, he told me this history when I went to see him. Then he would have told the same to the doctor. He hasn't even looked at the leg. He hasn't even touched him. But he gave, according to the patient's demand, he gave three, two, three antibiotics. So patient demand is also a bad thing. So the doctor should be um, quite uh, knowledgeable and should be rational and should be very confident on what he's doing on treating infections. Otherwise, do not do it and refer it to somebody else who can do it well. But people do not do like that. Um, people always think, why can't I use antibiotic? I know this antibiotic will work for this one, work for that one, and why can't I use it? So it's not like that. You can use the first dose if the patient is in danger. If you know the sepsis uh, cascade, and if the patient is going towards uh, um, the, the, I mean, if you know a sepsis, how to score a sepsis, it, at least in the basic manner, then if you can find out the, the, time to needle or urgency of antibiotic is there, then you can do something as a first dose and then uh, stabilize the patient and send to uh, somebody who can handle it better. So life saving is one thing and also um, saving many lives from resistant antibiotic related sepsis is another thing. So another thing, but two are interconnected. So make sure those who are listening um, online or in person, um, to learn this uh, with the colleagues who are trying their best to next to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vadnami. Next, we have Dr. Koshlani Jayatilaka, consultant microbiologist, Sri Jayawadhanapur General Hospital, and honorary senior lecturer, Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jayawadhanapur, speaking to us on implementation of antimicrobial stewardship in healthcare setting challenges faced in Sri Lanka. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, so I will be talking about the implementation in Sri Lanka and how challenging these antimicrobial stewardship programs in Sri Lanka. So uh, I'll be take, uh, talk, taking through like uh, what this antibiotic stewardship is and why it is important and uh, the challenges that we have faced. 
So what is the antibiotic, what is this antibiotic stewardship? Uh, it's, uh, it's the coordinated interventions uh, designated to improve and measure appropriate use of antimicrobials by promoting the correct drug regime, the dose, duration, and the route of administration according to the Infectious Disease Society of America. And why we should have it? Uh, we know that it can optimize our, uh, the uh, clinical outcome, it can minimize the toxicity, and it can reduce the cost, and then also it can limit the selection of antimicrobial resistant strains. So I will take you through a case. The, it's a, it's a one-week-old baby who, who had MRSA in the blood cultures, which was the first-line uh, the antibiotic sensitivity report said it's sensitive only to gentamicin, and the clinicians have started him on gentamicin. What's the drug of choice for, like, uh, vancomy sorry, uh, for MRSA sepsis in a neonate? It's vancomycin. Uh, what happened? The baby developed uh, sepsis and complications with uh, se uh, septic arthritis in multiple joints. So it is important to collect, uh, give the correct antibiotic at the correct, for the correct uh, infection. Uh, so you have to follow guidelines. For example, uh, for MRSA bacteremia, there are guidelines, so you have to follow them. The case number two, it's a 65-year-old who came with dengue and was, while being on treatment, uh, there was a secondary fever, at which point they collected blood cultures and it grew staph aureus, which was sensitive to flucloxacillin. And they started IV flucloxacillin 500 milligrams six hour early with IV clindamycin, to which it was sensitive, also sensitive, and uh, with 300 milligrams BD and treated for 14 days and discharged. Sorry, what happened to the patient? She, he was readmitted with sepsis. And at this point, the blood culture grew MRSA, which was sensitive earlier, the staph aureus, now it's a MRSA. And uh, echo showed vegetations, uh, diagnosis of endocarditis was made, and uh, it was treated with vancomycin, the loading dose, and the correct dose was given, and the drug levels were monitored, and the area under the curve was uh, calculated. But still, the patient had septic emboli, and we had, he had to undergo valve replacement surgery. So what was the problem? Initially, he was treated only with flucloxacillin 500 milligrams six hourly, Though the drug was correct for the staph aureus, the dose was inadequate. So the correct drug, correct dose, very important to get the correct outcome. Then the third patient was undergoing dialysis through a central line, and they have noticed some pus at the exit site. They took a swab for culture, which grew MRSA, but the, there was only mild fever, and it responded uh, quickly when the line was removed, and they have sent the patient home on oral antimicrobials antibiotics uh, for a few days. Patients uh, later came with endophthalmitis. So probably we have missed a bacteremia, at uh, which point uh, we, we have not treated for adequate duration. And uh, the MRSA was there in the eye, uh, the, the enucleated eye, which they could not save with uh, intravitreal antibiotics. So we know that according to guide, evidence-based guidelines, staph aureus bacteremia uh, should be treated with minimum of 14 days of antibiotics, which did not happen. And also, they have another important point, uh, lesson to learn in this case is they have not taken a blood culture, though there was some pus at the exit site, which we should now, I think, insist, because we know that the, we have created a line, uh, the pathway uh, from the exit site to the back blood. So it's very important that we do a blood culture at that point so that we don't miss these patients. So... Uh, another important thing is the correct route, like uh, for example, for endocarditis, there's no oral option, we have to give IV therapy. And whenever possible, in other infections, uh, IV can be converted to oral as soon as it's uh, suitable. The next thing is to minimize the toxicity. Uh, so we have to consider the patient's condition, uh, physiology of the patient, um, and the PKPD, uh, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics, and also the correct drug regime uh, so that you don't have to unnecessarily add antibiotics which can be toxic uh, if there's no evidence that there's synergy uh, or any other reason uh, which acceptable by evidence. And correct dosing is very important uh, so that we know that uh, sometimes like aminoglycosides, we recommend once daily dosing which may be more efficacious than the uh, multiple doses. 
and also it will reduce cost because it will reduce the hospital stay, the reduce uh, unnecessary antibiotic cost, and also it will reduce the cost of investigations and management of complications of the diseases and side effects of the treatment. Then, if you, uh, how can it limit the selection of antimicrobial resistant strains? So we know that bacteria multiplies fast, and while being uh, while multiplying, there is always a chance that they get uh, you know these uh, uh, there are mutations happening. So uh, if I, sorry, if I can get the so if you can see that there are two sorry uh, trying to get a pointer here. Yeah, so you can see that there are two bacteria which have changed their genetic material. That is a mutation. And those two, maybe this uh, genetic material is now the DNA part, uh, which is the mutation is coating for uh, resistant mechanisms, like uh, maybe a beta-lactamase or something. And uh, now if you get this uh, population exposed to antibiotics, the sensitive bacteria will be killed and only the resistant bacteria will remain. Now, without any competition from any other bacteria, these resistant bacteria will multiply to form a uh, population of antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is, the, which is what happens so when we take antibiotics in our gut flora, in our intestines, the normal flora. And also, the other important thing about this is like, uh, if the resistance gene is on a plasmid, that is, these are transferable, so one bacteria can send it to the others by conjugation or transduction or transformation. And also, uh, so what can we do about this? The uh, one thing is like, uh, if you stop using antibiotics, we can uh, reduce the resistance. So it is very uh, good, nice example here in, in broiler, where in Denmark they have stopped the antibiotic, they have banned the antibiotic use in broiler, and you can see the resistance also came down to zero when they were not using antibiotics in this uh, broiler. So same thing will happen in uh, humans as well. But uh, I, of course, we need to use it whenever necessary. So we have to uh, sort of prevent uh, unnecessary use of uh, antibiotics. So that is what uh, I think uh, Rohini was also trying to uh, explain. And also when you use it, uh, you have to think of the pharmacokinetics, that is uh, how they get absorbed uh, and how they get uh, uh, disseminated and eliminated from the body. And also, the effects of the drug, like pharmacodynamics, like the toxicity, the uh, effects, and the, so, uh, and the uh, final uh, outcome. So uh, basically, uh, one thing that you have to remember is now, if you take a bacterial col uh, colony or um, population of bacteria, there may be few mutants, uh, the red ones here. And if you give a very small dose, you may, now if you look at the concentration that you achieve in the blood, will be very low with, the, with that dose. Therefore, it will not kill any bacteria, and it will not be effective to treat the infection. But if you give a moderate dose, it may go above the minimum inhibitor concentration, and it will kill the sensitive bacteria, but it will make the resistant bacteria multiply, like I, what I showed you earlier. So now the recommendations are, like, you have to give high doses so that even the mutations are killed. So that is important to prevent development of resistance. Then another important thing is that there are certain antibiotics which are dependent on the, they are called time dependent, like the beta-lactam antibiotics, where you have to uh, make sure that you are giving the antibiotic and keeping a level above the MIC as long as possible. So for that, we recommend prolonged inf infusion. Uh, and like meropenem, we always recommend prolonged infusion when it's necessary. Uh, and also like aminoglycoside, it is concentration dependent. So therefore, to get a high peak, once daily dosing is better. And also, some antibiotics may need area under the curve like vancomycin and flu fluoroquinolones. So how do we uh, now uh, do this antibiotic stewardship program? There are six elements that are recommended in the IDSA, and th there are some active strategies, some supplemental strategies, and of course the information technology is very useful, and microbiology laboratory is uh, essential to have a good support. Uh, and also monitoring process uh, should be in place, so that process and outcome measurements should be monitored, and comprehensive multidisciplinary team approach is recommended. So what are these active strategies? There are two active strategies that they usually recommend. One is the prospective audits of antimicrobial use, where you can you know, let them prescribe what they want, but you can audit and give feedback. Uh, they, that is being proven that it is effective in small and large hospitals, but it can, the computer surveillance also will be useful for this. 
But the other important thing that we can do, the other active strategy is the formulary restriction and pre-authorization pre requirements for specific agents. Like uh, reduce, that will also reduce the antibiotic use and the cost. But only thing is it will depend on the person who is, should be authorizing this. So if you authorize all what is coming through, then it will not make a big impact. But if you are really strict about it, you can reduce the unnecessary antibiotics. And uh, use the pharmacy and the therapeutic committee or equivalent group. Then the supplemental strategies recommended are to have guidelines, the clinical pathways, the education, antimicrobial order forms, streamlining or de-escalation when necessary, and dose optimization and IV to oral conversion as required. So information technology can help where computer decision support and computer surveillance can be used. And microbiology laboratory is essential to give the, identify the correct pathogens and to give the correct reports on antibiotic susceptibility testing and to uh, have resistance surveillance going on and to help in the local outbreak investigations. And Sri Lanka, of course, the microbiologists play a major role in these stewardship programs as the leaders of them and also monitoring and pre-authorization. So it's a major component. So monitoring uh, process should have process indicators and outcome indicators, like uh, indicators of the documentation or whatever you have recommended, the process, and also the outcome. So uh, it's a comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary approach is important, where the teams uh, should be appointed a team approach, and all should be responsible for this. It's not only the microbiologist's work to do the stewardship, it is a team that should be responsible, and the hospital administrative support is essential and consensus building between administrators and providers, focusing on patient safety rather than just policing, because it's not something that we are going to find fault with people, or we are trying to do the best for the patients. So uh, in CDC, they have recommended the prescribing antibiotics after culture and giving the right drug, right dose for the right duration, and uh, to reassess the process after 48 hours of prescription. Any antibiotic, if patient is started on an antibiotic, we have to review it after 48 to 72 hours. And the documentation is important, and uh, the dose, duration, and the indication why we started this, whether it's prophylaxis or treatment, and be aware about the antibiotic-resistant patterns, and of course, the prevention is important with the hand hygiene and other measures. Then the stewardship team, which is recommended by the IDSA, include the ID physicians, that is infectious disease physicians, clinical pharmacists with ID training, clinical microbiologists, information system specialists, infection control professional, and hospital epidemiologists. So at national levels in Sri Lanka, in 2016, we were trying to implement a national antimicrobial stewardship program, which was proposed and was discussed at a multidisciplinary meeting in 2016. But uh, at that point, the clinicians were not very happy to have the whole program uh, in place. At, as an introduction, uh, it was decided to in introduce this red light antimicrobials. That means like a traffic-like traffic -like system, we thought the red light antimicrobials are the restricted antimicrobials at that time. So this was in 2016, whereas later the aware classification from, two, uh, from the WHO came in 2017. So we were ahead of WHO and we gave a different uh, classification like red, orange and green, but only the red light antimicrobials were issued as a circular from the Ministry of Health. So the Director General of Health at that time, Dr. Mahipala, was very interested in this and we had, we had, had a good leadership from him. So challenges faced in Sri Lanka. So we don't have these ID trained clinical pharmacists or hospital epidemiologists. And neither we have ID physicians in our uh, hospitals, but uh, fortunately we have clinical microbiologists who work as ID physicians, so I suppose it's not a major thing. But not having adequate number of clinical microbiologists is a major challenge because we have to do all the other duties as well as the stewardship work. It is not a priority for the administrators and the clinicians, I would say, because though the administrators like Dr. Mahipala was uh, very much interested, but it is uh, not all, uh, always the same. And monitoring mechanisms are not in place nationally. Uh, antimicrobial stewardship program was introduced to the hospital of uh, Sri Jawadhanapura General Hospital in 2016. And there we decided to have a team with consultant microbiologists, a physician, and an anesthetist, and a pharmacist, infection control nurse, and the IT specialist. 
and uh, we face several challenges but because it is not a priority for the administrators and the clinicians so uh, that support was uh, i mean some were supporting it uh, but it's uh, limited because they were busy with other work and infectious disease physicians clinical pharmacists uh, specially trained on id and uh, hospital epidemiologists were not available and uh, so these were the things that we uh, sort of uh, had our in our policy where we had they had to document uh, always uh, indication should be documented and uh, the dose frequency and duration should be documented and appropriate sample should be collected before the uh, prescribe before prescribing antibiotics and we gave the guidelines on antimicrobial prescri prescribing and authorization levels we introduced the three levels red orange and green and uh, it, it is essential to review them at 48 hours when they are started on antibiotics and to streamline and de-escalate and also uh, to look for side effects and monitor, the, monitor them, uh, do the proper monitoring for looking for side effects and convert to oral whenever possible and surveillance, feedback and utilization and local resistant patterns was also important and we identified certain process and outcome indicators. So this is the chart that we uh, gave to the boards with red, orange, and green light antimicrobials. And it was given like a fl flip chart. And in that, we also had the summary of uh, many, uh, the empirical antibiotic th treatment for different uh, infections. And this is the anti uh, new chart that we introduced for the antibiotics uh, to our drug chart at one page is now dedicated for antimicrobial prescription. And in that, we have a place for them to mark the indication uh, and also who prescribed it and whether the cultures were collected. And also, a 48-hour review uh, column was also introduced. So challenges faced. Some red light antimicrobials were available in the oral preparation and was available in the community pharmacies. And therefore, it was already the patient was on them when they came to the hospital. So it was sort of an uh, odd thing to say, now you can't prescribe it for the other doctors who are in the, and the specialists who are in the uh, hospital. And monitoring of antibiotic consumption is not easy because um, sometimes they can just get a prescription and get the antibiotics from outside though uh, the patient is in the uh, ward. Uh, so audit report was, uh, we did an audit on this and uh, later we found out that uh, the, the, it was very difficult, challenging to get this documentation and the implementation of pre-authorization and 72 hour review. And also inadequate number of dedicated staff was a pro problem and the number of referrals, but but the good thing was that we had increased number of referrals to the microbiology department after this incident. So that means some physicians, some clinicians were very happy to get our opinion uh, to continue antibiotics. Uh, and uh, this is another important thing that we found out. The meropenem use uh, we calculated and it was like 30.7 before the implementation of the program and it came down to 23.4 uh, DDDs, that is uh, defined daily doses per thousand inhabitants per day, which was like if you compare it with the European Union, the, the say two countries like Netherlands had 0 0.019 and Greece had 0 0.143. So it, you can see how, how much we use like more than uh, the European Union, why they have less resistance. So uh, if you look at it, it's almost like 3% of our hospital inpatients were on carbapenems. So it's not a very good thing. And uh, I was, it was unbelievable. And also then we did an audit. Uh, the, uh, in one particular day, we went throughout the hospital and we just had a look at the patients, uh, BH, uh, BHDs, drug charts. And then we found out that 2.4% were on carbapenems. So that is correct. It's, it's almost uh, similar to what we saw with the consumption data at that point. So way forward is that National Antimicrobial Stewardship Program should be recommenced uh, with uh, restrictions in availability of these restricted antimicrobials in the community pharmacies, which is important. Otherwise, we can't make this, have, uh, I think, uh, practical. And a proper monitoring system should be in place centrally as well as in the hospitals. And also identifying the need for clinical pharmacists with special training on ID and hospital epidemiologists and increasing the number of clinical microbiologists in hospitals and working towards having these services. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayatilaka. We now have our third speaker this afternoon, Dr. Madhumani Abhevardhana, consultant clinical microbiologist, National Hospital Kandy, who will be speaking to us on introducing aware classification an antibiotic stewardship in primary care setting. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about 
earlier classification uh, and the antibiotic stewardship, especially in primary care setting. Before going to the topic, actually, I thought of giving some kind of background uh, information. So uh, this is a blood culture report uh, of, a, of one of our patients in Candy Hospital, as you can see, because it is not very visible. I took the, uh, the report to, to be seen clearly. So can you see the blood culture has grown Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is resistant to all the antibiotics we have tested. Actually, we have, to be frank, we have tested everything available in Sri Lanka. So this is the situation we are at this moment. So this, this is, just imagine it is one of your patients. So this is, the, this is the current situation. Uh, so that as other speakers uh, discussed already, antimicrobial resistance is a global threat. Uh, prediction is uh, that 10 million people will die by 2050 just because of antimicrobial resistance, and it is a third global burden disease causing death. So what is the cost? We, we are aware, of course, the cost is death due to treatment failure disability, long hospital stay, and medical expenses. So this is something we have to address very quickly. It's actually, it's too, almost late. So AMR occurs naturally over the time. So antimicrobial resistance occurs even though we don't use antibiotics, but what we do with overuse and misuse is accelerate the development of AMR. So at least we can try to uh, slow down the appearance of antimicrobial resistance. How do we reduce? Reduce uh, by uh, selective, uh, we, we can reduce the selective pressure exerted by the use of antibiotics. So that is sensible regulation of drugs, or two speakers discuss about that, and informed and cautious prescribing. So we have guidelines. And we had red light gu antibiotic guideline, as uh, Madam Kushlani said earlier. And of course, with those things, we have to go for antibiotic stewardship. Plus, strict infection control practices, including hand washing. With that, with guidelines, we can go forward. So red light antibiotics um, were uh, introduced to our country, our hospitals, in 2016. Um, but unfortunately, majority of the hospital in Sri Lanka didn't follow these guidelines, not up to the 100%. Actually, I must say that it is followed up to some level, 50 to 100. Uh, it seems that Sri Jawaharlalpur is doing very well, but not in all the other hospitals. So the WHO has developed another support, a VR classification of antibiotics. It is almost similar, which was developed in 2017 by WHO Expert Committee on Selection and Use of Essential Medicines. It is a tool to support stewardship, so it, we can use it to support. So there are antibiotic, uh, antibiotics are classified into three groups. You can see the same colors here. The names are a little different. So access group, watch group, and reserve group. So they have considered the impact of different antibiotics on antimicrobial resistance uh, Resistance, so the, the, that means excess antibiotics might not cause antibiotic resistance as much as the reserve antibiotic. So they, they try to do uh, the, emphasize the importance of the appropriate use by having this classification. So, uh, and of course, it's like our traffic light system, excess green, watch orange, and reserve red. And uh, WHO have published this handbook, uh, Avia Antibiotic Book. It's a very big one, but giving a lot of information. The target of this uh, introduction is uh, to improve the use of antibiotic with using Avia book. So, uh, and uh, of course, they have discussed no antibiotic care, safely reducing antibiotic use. So that is something they have emphasized in this book. 
So in, and the improving and uh, access antibiotic use and reducing the in, an, uh, inappropriate use of oral and IV watch antibiotics and uh, reducing the use of not recommended antibiotics. So there's one more uh, group of antibiotics which they have mentioned as not recommended antibiotics as well in this uh, handbook and improving awareness. Improving appropriate antibiotic dosing and duration, which was discussed in uh, Madam Kushalani's lecture and uh, Madam Rohini uh, Vadanambi's lecture as well. So, what is no antibiotic care or safely reducing antibiotic use? As we know, most otherwise healthy patients do not re require antibiotic for mild, self limiting, even bacterial infections. So we have to give our attention to these, this group and we must stop using antibiotics or at least reduce the use. And we have to think about adverse events outweigh the clinical benefits because uh, giving antibiotic to a viral infection will cause only the adverse effects. There's no benefit at all. And the risk of taking antibiotic consider the side effects. There could be allergic reactions we have seen. Uh, several in the last few months, and uh, Clostridium difficile infections and selec selection of resistant bacteria. So, common infections, mild cases, can be safely treated with no antibiotics, just supportive treatment. Example, acute diarrhea, most of the time it's viral, even bacterial diarrhea does not uh, uh, require antibiotics if it's not very severe. And acute bronchitis, most of the time vi viral. Uh, COPD exacerbation, most of the time, not very severe ones, but otherwise. Otitis media, as Madam uh, Rohini said. And pharyngitis, again, most of the time viral. And sinusitis. But as you may uh, reflect, all these uh, conditions are treated in, with antibiotic in most of the time in our hospitals. So about the aware classification again, in 2019, WHO aware classification database included 180 antibiotics. And by 2021, they have increased by 78, and the total now is 258. So these, uh, not actually, uh, the, the total of antibiotics, this 2258 uh, is not used, uh, and it is not available for treatment. So they have uh, arranged another kind of like... Uh, list which is I will discuss about later. So the target is to have 60% of total antibiotic consumption being access group antibiotics. So we are leaving watch and re reserved groups for less than 40%. And these classifications are uh, updated every two years. Just a glance at the common infections and uh, aware book. So if you can see, I hope you can see, so bronchitis, no antibiotic. And uh, community acquired pneumonia, access antibiotics. That means amoxicillin or phenoxymethyl penicillin. You might, I mean, you might not agree. So maybe we will have to, depending on our sensitivity patterns, we may have to increase a bit, but still being in the uh, access group. Chronic uh, COPD, that is excess, again, you can treat with uh, excess and antibiotics such as amoxicillin or coamoxicillin. Uh, dental infections, again, uh, you may have seen so many antibiotics are used, but in my uh, experience, actually, uh, uh, dental surgeons are the persons who use antibiotics very, uh, very uh, carefully. Because they, do, do, they normally do, don't go beyond uh, coamoxicillin, what I have seen in my experience. So it's, we have to admire their um, uh, restrict, restricting antibiotic uh, policy. Uh, and infectious diarrhea, watch. So no antibiotic or watch. So that, uh, as I said, it's most of the time viral. And very rarely it could be due to Campylobacter. Uh, where you have, you may ha use ciprofloxacin, which is in the watch group, 
And otitis media, again, if it is severe, uh, access group antibiotics. So what is this access group antibiotics? Antibiotics with activity against wide range of, I will show you the antibiotics in watch group that you will understand that is, that is kind of enough to treat most of the infection. They have lower resistance potential. They even with their using of the access antibiotics, the resistance appearance is, is not very high. And selected uh, access group antibiotics are recommended as first line or second line, second choice of empiric treatment. It got 48 antibiotics. Some of are here. So these are the very familiar antibiotics we come across. Amicacin, amoxicillin. Uh, I think Kushlan Madam is not very happy having amicacin in uh, uh, access group. Um, and so we, we may have to adopt our, our antibiotics in our country. So, but uh, otherwise, like amoxicillin, ampicillin, uh, benzathine penicillin, uh, cephalexin, and uh, so on, which are very uh, familiar antibiotics for us. Flucloxacillin, gentamicin, nitrofurantoin, they all are in the green, that is, uh, access group. Next is watch group. Antibody with higher resistant potential. So with use of these antibiotics, the organism can become resistant in time. Includes most of the higher priority agents and uh, which we need for critically ill patients. So we have to prioritize as key targets in our stewardship programs, limiting the uh, watch antibiotics usage in hospitals. It could be essential to first or second choice of empiric treatment for limited number of specific infection, but not for every infection. So watch group again got 110 antibiotics. Of that, we have few antibiotics which are familiar. Uh, acetromycin, cefixim, cefotaxim. I think I have a separate slide. So these are the things in watch group we, we are familiar with. Uh, acetromycin, kefixim, kefetaxim, keftazim, all the kefra, uh, apart from kefalexin, third generation is kefalosporins, and uh, fluoroquinolones, you can see ciprofloxin here and levofloxin. Clarithromycin, again in this group, and uh, the carbapenams here, um, um, and uh, yeah, ticoplanin and vancomycin also here. So these are watch group antibiotics, which we have to use with. Uh, uh, carefully. And the reserve group antibiotics treatment confirmed or suspected infections due to multidrug resistant organisms. It, these are, it cannot be used just like that. So uh, these uh, medicine could be protected and prioritized as a key targets of national and international stewardship programs. There are 22 antibiotics in that group and uh, here are they and of which uh, we know that astrinam is not freely available in Sri Lanka, as well as keftacidim avibacter. It's not registered yet in Sri Lanka, but colistin. And uh, colistin is there from the antibiotics uh, of this group. Phosphomycin we don't have. We have linus olive, which is abused, abused very heavily. We got to the cycling. So we have got few of uh, restricted antibiotics here. And there are some antibiotics which are called not recommended antibiotic. Uh, the antibiotics, the use of which is not recommended due to several reasons. And these are, of course, not very familiar for us. As you can see, we don't have these antibiotics uh, uh, registered, definitely not registered in our country. There are several, one or two, two, two or three antibiotics together. So. Hopefully, we don't have to worry about that. So, looking everything in a kind of a nutshell. Uh, so, da uh, antibiotics on 23rd WHO model list of essential medicines. They have um, they have given, I think, 49 antibiotics, of which few are red, that is, uh, reserve antibiotics. Uh, and uh, we got here and uh, and and some are here. 
uh, as I said, the colistin, linasolid, and uh, meropenem, vabobactam, again, not available in Sri Lanka, uh, are the ones in this group. And uh, you can see, majority are green access antibiotics, which we have to, en we, we, I mean, if necessary, of course, uh, to uh, uh, say you can use uh, for bacterial infection, we are indicated. So regarding primary health care, so this is the target actually in this uh, aware classification to restrict antibiotic in primary care settings. Obviously, primary health care settings, you don't get patients very, where you need to treat patients with sepsis and all because uh, you might give the first dose of antibiotics sometimes and you may trust the patient for a better uh, the hospital with better facilities. So primary care settings, uh, the most common infections you get is bronchitis, acute otitis media, pharyngitis, acute sinusitis, where antibiotics are not needed for most cases. Or actually, you, can, you may use access group antibiotics. And I have just taken a picture from the, uh, uh, ex, uh, the this AVIA handbook, where it's very, if you go through it very easy with giving so many um, details. It's a big book, though. And impetigo, uh, skin, uh, skin and soft tissue infections, you can limit to access antibiotics. Although you may see cellulitis patients being treated with meropenem and dimipenem which are not needed at, at all. So urine tract infection, where you can use uh, access group antibiotics, uh, committee-acquired committee -acquired pneumonia, mild cases, you can use uh, access group antibiotic. Um, so, and the severe cases of force, uh, watch group and access group. And these are some uh, examples why we need this aware classification guidelines. Can you see this, uh, this is from a BHT? We are um, total abuse of antibiotics being done, flucloxacinin, dinosolid, tiglanin, these are given. Um, you can see, I mean, the, the rationale, you can't, rationale, you can't just, you can't imagine the rationale at all. So these are the things we have to stop because we are in danger. And here, of course, uh, linosolid being the reserve antibiotic. So overlapping cover, giving the uh, same thing again. And uh, you don't see rationale in so many uh, prescriptions if you go through hospital BHDs. The, these are not, candy from not, not from Candy Hospital, fortunately. Um, so in summary, so we, are, we have reached pre-antibiotic era. Nothing to treat MDR infection unless we reverse this resistance back, which is not very easy. Uh, preserving the available antibiotics, the only option, with good legislation and authority. And with that rational use of antibiotics. So we will try to follow the aware uh, classification of antibiotics to preserve and save our available antibiotics as Madam said, there's nothing much coming in future. Thank you.